بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم مادریتر Your Excellency Tun Dr. Mahathir Muhammad Your Excellencies Brothers and Sisters Comrades and Friends Wa Assalamu Alaikum Peace be on all of you With the tears of the Iraqi children still wet on our faces with the cries of the torture victims in the exhibition still ringing in our ears and with the magnificent speech of Dr. Mahathir inspiring us we begin our concentration on the great issues raised in that speech. Malaysia is truly fortunate to have had such a leader as Mahathir. And the world is fortunate that God has given him and hopefully will give him many more years of retirement from Malaysian politics to play the role in the world that he is now playing. In the short period I have to address you, 20 minutes might not seem short to you, but nowadays at my age I'm used to speaking for 60 minutes or more. And with so many case studies of the failures of the international organizations to deal with these issues of war, I have time to deal with only four, the first of which is the most recent. On the 27th of December last, less than 12 months ago, the State of Israel, in its stylized way, launched a massive bombardment of an entirely captive, virtually defenseless civilian population in the Gaza Strip, a territory which has been occupied and besieged for more than 40 years in defiance of international law, in defiance of United Nations Security Council resolutions, where 80% of the population are refugees and therefore the international legal responsibility of the international community where 80% of the people are living on a dollar a day and 80% of the people are unemployed, a territory, the most densely populated piece of land on the earth with only one entrance and one exit controlled by the people who were about to launch the bombardment. Far from coming to the defense of those for whom they had legal responsibility. The international community stood by, except where it was actively collaborating with the aggression and allowed a massacre, a modern day massacre of men, women and children to take place. Over 22 days, <coughs> over 22 days, 1,416 Palestinians were killed, the vast majority of them civilian people, the majority of them women and children. Thousands more were maimed, hundreds of new orphans were created, schools and hospitals were destroyed, paramedical facilities and ambulances deliberately targeted. Illegal weapons, never mind the terrifying nature of the conventional legal weapons, illegal weapons were deployed and we saw them live on television. We saw the white phosphorus gas, imagine a country calling itself the Jewish state using poison gas against captive civilians who had nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. And we saw that phosphorus gas rain down, not just on the hovels of the refugee camps, 
not just on the poverty-stricken urban concentration of Gaza, but upon United Nations facilities themselves. United Nations compounds containing United Nations food deliberately targeted and burned. United Nations schools and clinics hit by a blizzard of phosphorus and other banned and illegal weapons. And still, the international community remains silent or at least inactive. I, on the 10th of January, in the midst of this disastrous onslaught, announced in London the creation of Viva Palestina, which was determined to take convoys of aid from all parts of the world to arrive at Gaza besieged. Besieged, moreover, because in the Arab world's only ever free and fair election, they had elected a government of which London and Washington and Tel Aviv did not like so much for wars, for democracy. The Palestinian democracy has been drowned in siege and blood. We left England with a convoy of hundreds of vehicles, hundreds of British citizens. We drove through France and Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, and waited at the gates of Gaza until they were opened. The whole population of Gaza, the entire population, came out to receive our convoy, our caravan. And we were momentarily very proud of ourselves until we viewed the sea of troubles in which we were merely a drop in the ocean of the relief that was necessary. I spoke to the children who had lost their parents, the parents who had lost their children, the homeless people now living in the rubble, 80,000 houses destroyed in 22 days, 80,000, not one of which has been able to be repaired because of the siege. I spoke to one girl in particular whose testimony I must bring you here in Malaysia. She was nine years old. She was staying with her grandmother when she received the news that her house had been destroyed and her mother and her father, all five of her brothers, had been killed. She was now quite alone, an orphan amidst the rubble of the family home that had been hers. And she asked me this, and I'm asking you. She said, where is this Arab world they teach us about in school? Where is this Ummah they teach us about in school? Why did they leave us alone? to face this? What did we do to deserve to be left alone to face this? And so I determined upon a second convoy, this time from the United States of America, and led by our sister, the hero, Cynthia McKinney, and others. <laughs> recruited for the convoy when she was still in an Israeli jail having been seized from a boat trying to enter Gaza by sea. On the 4th of July, when else, we left the United States with hundreds of Americans and we made our way to Gaza. We faced many difficulties in Egypt, about which least said the better, because we intend to go back to Egypt over and over and over again until this siege of Gaza is ended. And on the 6th of December, in just a few weeks' time, we faced many difficulties in Egypt, about which least said the better, because we intend to go back to Egypt 
over and over and over again until this siege of Gaza is ended. And on the 6th of December, in just a few weeks' time, we will leave London again with a British and American convoy of aid. We hope it will be 500 vehicles long, five miles long, driving through Europe and Turkey and Syria and Jordan and Egypt until we arrive in Gaza. And I hope Malaysia will be represented on that convoy. I hope the name of Malaysia can be present somehow on that convoy. But the reason we are having to do this, and they're all just drops in the ocean, is because the international community continues to punish the victims of terrorism and reward the perpetrators of terrorism in the form of the state of Israel, a country which has broken more international laws than all the countries of the world put together, and yet which is greeted with a red carpet whilst its victims are called terrorists. The last time I spoke here, I told you about St. Augustine and his description of the encounter between Alexander the Great and a pirate. Ordering the pirate to halt, Alexander demanded, how dare you terrorize these waters as a thief? And the pirate answered, how dare you terrorize the whole world? You who can call yourself an emperor and can call other men as you please. That's the world order that we have today. Those who call themselves emperors invent their own laws and invent their own permissions to bring death and war and devastation and siege and sanction and occupation upon others. And that's what we have to change. In Lebanon, in 2006, Israel, for the umpteenth time, launched yet another invasion, yet another occupation of a neighboring Arab country. Again, they used banned and illegal weapons. They destroyed the economy of Lebanon. They destroyed deliberately all the bridges, the schools. They intended to teach the Arabs a lesson. But by the grace of God, Said Hassan Nasrallah and Hezbollah taught them a lesson instead. Which is a note of optimism I wish to introduce. You see, for all that terrifying weaponry that accompanied the speech of Dr. Mahathir, the one thing that has been established these last seven years is that they can control the skies. They can have all the weapons that their wealth can buy them. But individual men and women in their sandals, with their bare feet, with their Kalashnikovs, and with their determination to defend their country against invasion, can still defeat them as they have been defeated in Iraq. Because they launched all those weapons against Iraq. They destroyed Iraq. They broke it into pieces. They killed a million Iraqis. They sent three million Iraqis into exile. The lucky ones here in Malaysia. The unlucky begging on the streets of a man in Jordan for the means of staying alive. They broke Iraq but they did not break the resistance of the Iraqi people, which continues until this day and will continue until victory. But the last of my four examples that I have time to give relates in a way to the big picture. As we saw on the film accompanying the speech, these powerful countries, including my own, are powerful and have vetoes 
in the United Nations because they possess the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. They who possess thousands of nuclear weapons are busily threatening Iran, which doesn't have any nuclear weapons, with sanction and with potential invasion and occupation. Iran, according to al Baradai, the head of the IAEA, whose job it is to police these matters, has no nuclear weapons. There is no evidence that she is trying to produce a nuclear weapon, according to al Baradai. yet she is under threat. Whilst Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons, illegally acquired, undeclared, subject to no treaty for having no declared nuclear weapons, Israel declines to sign the non-proliferation treaty. Yet, not only unsanctioned goes Israel, but endlessly rewarded with new weapons, new monies, new diplomatic and political honors and support. What kind of message is this to the world? After all, and by the way, I'm against nuclear weapons. I was arrested outside the British nuclear weapons plant and carried away by the police on television. I gave the BBC the only ever recorded interview of a man being carried upside down by a group of police officers. And you can find it on YouTube if you like. I'm against nuclear weapons. But what I can't accept is that some countries can have nuclear weapons while other countries cannot. And some countries can threaten the countries which do not with oblivion. I cannot accept that Israel can have a mountain of weapons of mass destruction threatening all of its neighbors whom it has regularly occupied and invaded, whilst those who have none must be blockaded and besieged and, if necessary, attacked. And this double standard is surely the heart of the matter. Iraq was invaded because it did not have weapons of mass destruction. North Korea will never be invaded because it has weapons of mass destruction. What kind of message is this to the world? Well, I know what kind of message it is to me, which is, I'd better get some weapons of mass destruction unless I want George W. Bush and Tony Blair to come and occupy me. Which is the opposite direction to the direction which we should be traveling. These hypocrites, not Democrats, these hypocrites, this hypocrisy, not democracy, must be our target. Dr. Mahathir was necessarily and objectively, correctly, pessimistic if we will truly be able to call these hypocrites and these war criminals to account, at least in our lifetime. And he's right about that. The structure and the realities of world power and world politics make it unlikely. But I tell you this, when that Iraqi journalist Muntadar al-Zaidi took off his shoes and threw them at the head of George W. Bush and then took off his second shoe and threw it at the head of George W. Bush. He was speaking for billions of people around the world when he denounced this criminal and then took off his second shoe and threw it at the head of George W. Bush. He was speaking for billions of people around the world 
when he denounced this criminal. In the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, in occupied Palestine, two weeks ago, Bush's poodle, Tony Blair, God help us, the next president of the European Union. They're determined to make everyone hate this European Union, I'll tell you. Tony Blair went to the mosque like a tourist. The Middle East peace envoy, not since Caligula appointed his horse as a proconsul of Rome, has there been a more inappropriate appointment than Tony Blair as a peace envoy to anywhere, never mind the Middle East. But as he strutted around the mosque, one brave Palestinian in the mosque shouted that he was a war criminal. A war criminal, he said. And so I say this, we might never get them into a real court, but we should get them into the tribunal here in Kuala Lumpur. We might never get them into a prison, but if everywhere they go, people are throwing their shoes and calling them war criminals, that'll do for me for now.